Reefing World. My name is Rich. This is Ben, and this is Reef Beef. On tonight's very special episode of Reef Beef, brought to you by Terra Reef, but more about that later, we have the incredible, the innumerable, the innumerable, the most awesome um, person that I know. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of this guy, and I can't believe he returns my phone calls. Craig Bingman is here, uh, the legend. Uh, Craig, Craig was uh, a legend when I started paying attention to reef keeping. He was uh, with articles about lime water and, and other chemistry things. Uh, he's a winner of the Mazna Award for being awesome. And uh, he's an all around great guy, very smart guy. He's one of the go-to. If I have a chemistry question, I'm going to ask Craig and I am not going to double check him because I trust him that much. So uh, we're gonna talk with Craig about a bunch of stuff. And uh, Craig, how are you doing this week? Good. Um, it's been kind of a wild week at work and I was trying to get a bunch of stuff done so I could relax and kind of kick back and chill with you guys. So I did that and uh, here we are. Great, we totally appreciate you being on. We've got a list of two or three things we need to talk about. Uh, you jump in on any of that whenever you want to. And then apparently you're gonna take us to task uh, and spank us with all your brief beef beefs. Which... <laughs> right to the woodshed, yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that damn woodshed. You're going to make us go pick our own switches. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so the first thing I wanted to talk about was that there was a few people talking about our use of language um, on the show. As I said a while ago, we are the uh, number one foul language reef podcast as voted on by FoulLanguageReefPodcast.com. Uh, they voted us number one. Uh, and and we, we do that on purpose. Um, well, kind of on purpose. Number the, one. The, the number one. The, <laughs> the point of this show is to be like how we are at a conference at the end of the day when we're going hanging out in the lobby or the lobby bar where we're just talking. And uh, I know some people like to listen to their podcasts while... Uh, their kids are in the same room and that might be problematic. I, I have a solution for you for that. Um, uh, why do you care what your kids hear is the number one thing. You don't, because I don't think it is, I don't think you care that your kids are exposed to foul language. What you really care about is that your kids know when it is and isn't appropriate to use foul language themselves. So, yeah. um, because like if 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 I say fuck and your kid doesn't know what fuck means, then it's totally appropriate for me to say fuck. If I say fuck and your kid does know what fuck means, it is totally appropriate for me to use the word fuck. Um, all you care about is that your kid knows there are times and places where they should or should not say fuck. And I believe you can have that conversation with your child and they will understand the difference. I think if you're just trying to hide the words from them, um, you're, you're setting yourself up for all kinds of problems. I mean, when you watch TV and you go out in public or movies or just all over the place, like invariably they're going to they're gonna hear the word. I mean, they're going to hear and see all sorts of things, and it's up to you to explain things to them. I'm sure that that's a pretty, I mean, it could probably, it's probably a polarizing thing, but, you know, we're just not, we, I don't think we try to use cuss words like out, you know, egregiously where we wouldn't do it. It's just we have a casual atmosphere and that's just the fucking way it is. Yeah. And if that's uh, problematic for you, we apologize. Uh, but that's kind of like the thing we're doing. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I made a deal with my daughter that she could use any word that she heard me use in the house. She, because I was not going to be able to control my language, uh, but there were they were at home words, and she couldn't use them outside of the house or when people who weren't in the know were in the house. And if she screwed that up ever, she would lose that privilege. And the next day, she came downstairs and said, "Dad, I'm going to fuck you in the ass." She was like five, <laughs> and she had no idea what that means. She just knew it was a lot of of words and she fell over laughing and then she looked at me terrified and i i laughed hysterically and um she's never screwed it up so that's and, parenting for me is right there and craig is real tight-lipped because he's like what in the hell am i doing what? here no uh i i have a four-year-old 
and he his vocabulary is growing every day. Yeah. <laughs> well, put the headphones on him. We'll help him out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it is June, so that means it is Pride Month. And uh, as much as we would like to be talking about the pride we have in supporting our LGBTQ brethren in the reef keeping world, we have to talk about reef to reef sucking and being discriminatory some more. Um, we hate talking about this, but we think it needs to be talked about because it sucks so much ass. It's in a bad way. It's just fucking stupid. Um, there's a, a while ago, last December, they changed their uh, Reef to Reef started taking LGBTQ stuff. Uh, they started editing things and deleting threads because they think somehow LGBTQ is not family friendly, which is insane. Um, there's a change.org petition that you can sign. Uh, we don't think they're gonna change because they we think they're dug in, but uh, because it's pride, people have been posting over there about pride and they let some of the posts stay up um, but the thing that I'm finding abhorrent now is that they're going in and changing the content of posts. Um, not oh, just, no the, yeah, they're, they're changing the meaning of the post. Deleting a post, I can understand, even though I think it sucks, but totally changing the meaning of what somebody wrote and making it seem like they wrote it is kind of beyond the pale. I've seen a couple ones too, where they, uh, they're putting some people under like, moderator review where they've posted and then it says that a moderator is looking at it to okay it as well yeah i'm on that they won't let me post anything without a moderator although although they, i think they still have me up as a as a as a reef squad helper person um <laughs> it's really interesting what they what they decide to go after and what they decide to go after um tal sweet wrote a piece on reefs.com which will link What's to up, below tal? Uh, it's fantastic, uh, and it kind of talks about all this and how it's dumb. Uh, so we'll, we'll link it there and and uh, uh, ask you guys to support this anti this stupidness. Go to Humblefish or somewhere else that doesn't suck. Humblefish, yeah, Craig. Yeah, I'll tell you about a mistake that I made. So I was, I signed the change.org petition very early because I'm very, very much opposed to anything that limits participation in the hobby. I think it's just it's ridiculous and, and counterproductive in addition to being, you know, selectively cruel in this case. So um, the mistake that I made was I didn't put my name. I, I didn't realize that I only had one chance to like make a comment publicly. Um, and I'm taking this opportunity now to make the, the comment that I, I should have made then. And that's what I just said. I think it's, it's horrible um, to make people feel unwelcome based on that. Um, and it's bad for the hobby, in addition to being cruel and awful. Yeah. I mean, if this was a, if this was a smaller forum, I think, I mean, obviously it would be more forgettable but it being the largest forum, it's just, you know, it was no, no one's trying to pick a fight with someone for no reason. It's just, it's just, you know, there, there's lots of us that aren't going to put up with this crap. It's just, let, let's get back to talking about reef tanks and not be discriminating on people for their things that they didn't choose. Here, here. All right. We'll move on to that. Dove, dovetailing into Craig Bingman because I talked with Craig Beefman a lot. Craig Beefman? Is that what we're going to call this episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Craig Beefman? Craig Beefman. Craig Beefman. Hey, wait, guys, can I debut something here, yeah. here and now? So, you know, I, I've never, I don't, I'm 46. I'm, my, tomorrow's my birthday. Happy birthday. And, yeah. So I've made it 46 years without a tattoo. But a couple of days ago, I got my first tattoo, and I, I, I want to debut it. Here, look, you got to protect Holy it. Holy shit. See? Look. See? <laughs> it's, it's my tattoo. I got it from Home Depot, and it's cool because it was even on the aisle with the painter's tape. Look at that. Tattoo. Damn. Check out. 
No you regrets. Could, I didn't know you could get you could get tattoos at Home Depot, but you know, it, it must be a Texas thing. It is. <laughs> let me see that. Let me see the gun. Let me. Damn! Look at the gun show. I'm carrying all them buckets around, boy. Tattoo. And look at that. That hair show is amazing. Yeah, isn't that kind of weird? I don't know why genetically my hair was just like no, and then it just stops. Yeah, I'm sure that's genetics. It's got nothing to do with your shirt. <laughs> it pulls my hairs out. <laughs> so my, uh, I, uh, one of the things that people, if they know me, know me for is having a tank with high phosphates and nitrates um, and a mixed reef. And Craig and I have talked a lot about this over the years. And a couple of years ago, I talked with Craig a bunch about um, dosing lanthanum chloride um, and uh, into the skimmer. So I wanted to talk to him about the efficacy of that before I started to do it, because I figured in the skimmer, uh, it's a nice place for it to, um, to react. Flocculate? And also to, to flocculate and what? Can what that be say? said, Craig? So oh, actually, um, I, I heard you guys talk about lanthanum in a previous episode, and and I uh, my my main you know reason for appearing here tonight was to staple both of your heads to the carpet for every single thing that you said that's wrong, and so I took a bunch of notes. And that, uh, that whole book lanthanum, must just be me. Lanthanum is like a, a chapter in here, so. <laughs> Oh man. Uh, yeah, we did talk about that. And uh, I think it can be very effective. I think you have to be uh, careful with how you dose it. Um, and the first person that I knew who was doing this at scale was, was Joe uh, in New York and, and his 10,000 gallon or whatever it is, 20,000 20, gallon aquarium. Joe yeah. Wyula? Not yeah. in a skimmer. He just doses into a sand filter. Okay. Yeah, just want to make sure. Yeah, okay. that's that's a good that's a good point. Um, and I think the question that you asked me was was does does it precipitate the phosphate? And then you use the word flocculate and and a bunch of other words. Um, they're all basically the same thing. It's like Eskimos have. Um, a, was it supposed to be like a hundred or whatever words for snow? Um, all of these things describe something, a, a solid coming out solution. So phase separation and, and making a new material that's not dissolved anymore. Um, flocks are usually pretty finely divided and, and fluffy. Sometimes I think when people hear precipitate, they think of something like, you know, kind of like heavy that's going to come out of solution and fall to the bottom of the tank and stay there or something like that. But uh, from a chemical perspective, it's all out of the water, right? They're, it's all not in solution anymore. And in, in that regard, they're kind of like, you know, there, there's nuances there, but they all basically mean the same thing in terms of the impact on soluble phosphate in your aquarium. Great. Um, I think that injecting it into the skimmer is a fantastic idea because it does make fairly finely divided precipitates initially, and that's what skimmers are best at removing from the water. Skimmers or foam fractionators are basically, you know, in addition to the, the, the chemistry that happens at the air water interface where you can uh, concentrate certain class of, of classes of molecules, they're also really good fine particle filters. So the, the stuff that comes out of skimmers is full of bacteria, phytoplankton, and other really small particles. And uh, it just seems like dosing the, the lanthanum directly into the skimmer body um, gives you the highest probability of actually removing the phosphate cleanly from the system than any Craig, other way. I, would, you, doing it. would you still run the, you know, the outflow from the skimmer through a bag or would it just running it in the, like, so there's a, um, there is a Seachem uh, skimmer and also the tons of skimmer that both both come with a bag that the that the flow comes out of to, to trap little bubbles like yeah that sounds like a bubble thing uh, separator more than anything else right um, I don't think that you would have to do that I think you could do that um, but it uh, I, I think the the skimmer itself should 
get rid of most of those fine particles. It's really quite effective at that. I mean, if you've ever had a an aquarium, you know, after you set it up or you stir up a bunch of fine material, you know, like off of new live rock or something like that, you throw a skimmer on there and it's pulling chalk out in no time. It's really going yeah. to town on that fine precipitate. So, well, super anecdotally, um, I've not seen what other people say they see. Uh, some people say they see from dosing lanthanum chloride where they find uh, white stuff stuck onto pumps or onto acrylic, um, not fines, but more plated out, I suppose. I'm, uh, you know, one of the big complaints is if you, if you're running a pump that, uh, that, that, that stuff will end up clogging the pump and getting on the impeller and impeding its, uh, go-ness. Yeah. <laughs> like, go well, I think probably injecting it into the intake of a pump is probably not the, yeah. not the method of choice there. So, um, I, I really, I think that the injecting it into the body of the skimmer is really about as good as you're going to do with that particular material. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I know about the way you use it is that you always dose it uh, slowly. Um, and there's always some phosphate left over in your system. You never put, push the inorganic phosphate to zero. And as long as you do that, the lanthanum is not going to be a problem. Lanthanum is kind of like a, in biology, it's kind of like a super calcium. So it's got a charge of plus three, looks a lot. It's more highly charged. Uh, otherwise, chemically behaves a lot like calcium. So it does everything that calcium does except better. And sometimes that's not a good thing because calcium can be a key regulatory molecule and things like that. So, uh, that I'm sure that the, the concentration of free soluble lanthanum in your system is, is like almost undetectable by any mechanism just because of you've got phosphate left over. Yeah. If, you, if you run lanthanum hard and you run it down to almost zero phosphate, then that's where things can get a little bit funny. And I think people have seen some maybe adverse reactions and some organisms I've heard maybe clams don't like it. And that wouldn't surprise me. They are complicated organisms. Uh, and uh, I, you know, they, they, they would be one of the species I, I suspect might have a problem with that. So okay. well, is I there have... any concern for, for a, a coral or clam or any, any calcifying animal like that to incorporate it into their skeleton? If it's, if it's in solution, it will be incorporated in the skeleton. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. If you do an assay on the, on the chemicals that are in coral skeleton, you'll basically, you'll find the whole periodic table there, right? So um, it's not a super highly regulated process. Um, it's, it's more regulated actually in, in mollusks. So they, they, have, they have much cleaner uh, carbonates that they, they precipitate than, than corals do. So, you know, I mean, you, you wind up with uranium and plutonium in, in coral skeletons where they set off atomic bomb tests and, and that kind of stuff. And it's all it's positively charged cations. It just goes in uh, in the same sites as calcium is. Yeah. I've got one, you know, clams suck at life kind of famously. Um, and about three years yeah, ago, I, I about three years ago, I went through a wanting to try clams again. And um, one of them uh, did well from the get-go. Um, why do I think that it did that? I think it, it attached to live rock in the tank right away instead of trying to get it to attach to something else that could move, um, which is something people recommend and I've tried to do. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, they get them onto a rock that you can move rather than but this one sucked right onto, you know, just boom, right onto the main structure. Um, and the other ones lasted three or four months and they went away. Um, and the people who bought the clams from the same people I did had the same experience. I think Ben was one of them as well. But this clam started small and is, is just growing gangbusters. So, so that's good in, um, or it seems good in regards to the lanthanumness and clams in my system at least. I got uh, I got six of them from that same place and all six are dead. 
But mm -hmm. I, I do really well with Squamosa and Darasa. It's just for me that Crocea and Maxima are tricky. Hippopus, Hippopus, I do well with too, but that's not one of the more popular species. Yeah. This is a Maxima. So what? there's one other little chemistry esoteric note that, that I don't think I've ever commented on before. So you, um, a brief that, beef exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's not like it's uh, not, I mean, Th this information is in the literature, but I just don't know that anybody said anything about it in the aquarium world. Um, so f there are these things that are called ion selective electrodes, and there is an ISE for fluoride, and it's it's a uh, one of the kind that there's a solid crystal that's that's does the same thing as the glass part of a pH electrode, and that that. Uh, crystal is made of lanthanum fluoride actually mm. and it turns out that if you knew what the fluoride concentration was in water uh, you could use one of those electrodes to measure free lanthanum kind of in real time which would be uh, and, and pretty sensitively as well uh, the, the concentration of fluoride in most reef tanks is like really low unless you're topping off with fluor fluoridated water um, because it winds up in coral skeleton too. So reefs are a huge fluoride sink in the ocean. Um, and I don't know that that, it's like one of these facts that's like, okay, and because nobody knows, you know, okay, but, but so what? They seem to do right. just fine without fluoride, right? Um, but they, they will not have very much in your, in your aquariums, yeah. so. Uh, you could use a fluor you could use a fluoride ISE to to track lanthanum if you were if you wanted to dose more aggressively and push the phosphate concentration very low. Well, I I so that's what I wanted to update you with the the initial you know I was doing like a thirty mil of lanthanum chloride diluted in three liters of um, distilled water and dosing that at like. 80 mil of that solution a day or 60 mil of that solution. I'd have to see, I'd have to go back and look at the notes. Yeah, it's like 60 to 80 because I wanted to make sure I went slowly because my tank was so high for so long, I wouldn't want to switch it right away. I mean, that's just your general reef thing too, right? Don't do anything quick. Right. Yeah. So I, sure. when I, before I started, the phosphate was running like 1.6, somewhere around there. And I got it down to you know point point two point three when i was uh, on top of it and really digging at it mm -hmm. and um you know playing with the the level going up a little bit or down uh but then you know when i had issues in the tank i would cut back on the lanthanum in case that was part of the issue um a few months ago um i decided because i'm uh, one of these tanks is being rented by a research group uh, that I was going to up my water changes because they're paying me to rent it. And uh, the easiest way to keep things clean is water changes, right? I think everything, everything we do is an excuse or is it an attempt to not do water changes where if we just did water changes. So uh, I've been doing automated water changes of about four liters a day. I, uh, about a, a couple of weeks ago, I upped it to five liters a day. And also a couple of big water changes just to get it moving. Um, I think I'll end up doing probably 50 liters a day of, of a water change or more. That's about, it's about 30% water change a month. Mm -hmm. I think that comes to. But the last time I tested was April 4th when I did my own tests. And I also sent out um, an ICP from a new company that I don't remember the name of right now. It's in Austria. Uh, but they, they made me filter the water before I sent it to them. So that made me feel like they actually care uh, and know things. Um, well, I'm sure you remember the conversations we had with Chris about all the ICP stuff and, and whether or not the samples are filtered is, uh, you know, one of these big questions about the, the methodology and what it really means, uh, what your water Richard, analysis Richard and means. Chris wrote a paper about that that's the one you're talking about where they spoke to you we'll we'll link that down in the show notes for people to read yeah i was kind of skulking around in the shadows on on that one for support but uh 
yeah, I mean, if if you can imagine that if there was like a fish swimming around in your, in your water and you sent it off for ICP, you'd probably find a lot of stuff in the water. It wasn't dissolved in there, it was in the fish. So if there's some small organisms in the water that have those nutrients sequestered, um, you might have a very different view of of those nutrients than nutrients that are, you know, inorganic and, and you know, just dissolved in the water. One case, yes. it might be food for your corals or whatever. In the other case, it might be food for your algae. Yeah, the company is called OCMO, Saltwater Analysis, and you can get it in the States uh, through Aqua Biomics. We'll put the links down there. Um, they seem to be doing a lot of things that when Chris and I wrote that article and talked to Craig about it, uh, they're doing a lot of things that the other companies were doing that made us squint. They're not doing those things. They're doing the things we thought should be done to make it more proper. Um, so we'll, we'll the see. the price of it still? It's about, know, the, about the I think it's about the same. I'll put the link to it. Um, I don't remember offhand. Uh, but, you know, Aqua Biomics is also doing the um, microbiome testing as well. What? 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 Huh? Huh? This episode is sponsored by Terra Reef. Yeah? Terra yeah. Reef. Yeah. They've got a new URL they want you to use. Ooh, um, cool. Shop.terrorreef.com slash pages slash reef beef. We'll, we'll put Ooh. that below because that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, yeah. But then you buy stuff, you get uh, exclusive reef beef discounts on that page. So unless you go to that page, you won't get the beefy discounts that uh, that uh, Terror Reef's going to give you. Um, and the link is going to be on the screen, apparently, as we talk and in the description now we you both, know what i like about their frags their frags are like very about, beefy they are beefy frags they're not some barely encrusted freaking tofu frag they're no. a damn beef frag yeah they move they move <laughs> that well of course it's terra reef you know it's but they're 100 percent aquaculture they have retail and wholesale well oh, they have a section called where's the beef so you can find yeah. the particularly awesome beefy fragments for sale, uh, which is great because often you put those in and they're going to encrust onto your live rock faster. So you're not going to see much of the plug at all. So I think that's a good thing. I saw a post from them today on Facebook where the owner actually went and calculated and, and actually drew little circles on all of the heads of a zoanthid plug to show you how many heads were on there. So I don't know what the heck he had going on. Maybe yeah. it was a slow day. <laughs> he, he really wanted to know. Yeah. Uh, they're 100% uh, aquacultured. They're all healthy grown in. You're not going to get any fresh cuts for them. Uh, they do retail and wholesale, and they got inexpensive shipping for retail. Uh, they're good, a good group uh, trying to do the right thing, uh, being responsible and sustainable. So we dig them, and uh, we hope you support them. Go to shop.terrorreef.com slash pages slash reef beef. What? 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 Huh? Huh? So, um, the phosphate uh, in um, April 4th was 0.45, and the nitrate, which is NO3 minus, because that's what the hobby uses, is uh, was 75.14. 75? 75. Nitrate? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and that's using the Hawk DR890. Mm -hmm. I tested today, and the phosphate was 0.27, and the nitrate was uh, 37. And the only thing really different you're doing is upping the water change? Upping the, upping the water changes. Now, the phosphate I've gotten down to 0.2 before, but yeah. the nitrate has stayed up, you know, around 50 has not really dipped below it so seeing that number come down makes me think maybe maybe i've done enough water changes to start getting ahead of the curve a little bit there mm -hmm. um so i'm going to turn that up and I'm, I'm still doing the lanthanum because it's so easy that there's no reason not to um uh, but i'm i'm now very interested again to see if the water changes will 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 do what i couldn't do chemically or filtery um, in the past, so so I'm I'm we'll have to have you back on in a few months and 
sure. see if there's something I well, can the, tell you. I mean, the lanthanum always obviously is helping your, your phosphate situation, but it's not going to do anything for the on the nitrate side. And yeah. I know that you talked in another episode about you know maybe using a, a sulfur denitrator or something like that, which would would attack that other that other component, but. Um, you know, you're you're a guy who has like how many thousands of gallons of salt water comes in on the back of the truck from <laughs> is it Pakistan or where? Uh, it come from? Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> Bob and his Pakistani water. The Pakistani water. I don't think I've told him about the Pakistani part. I should let him know <laughs> about that. I think it would make him laugh. I get about 500 gallons at, at, at a time, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna push it and see what happens. So I, I'm sure you measured the nutrients in that water. Is it pretty low? I have not just sent that out. That's a good point. I should just uh, do a test of his water. Yeah, you can do that. You just do nutrients with your little colorimeter. I mean, yeah. it does a good job. Test Bob's water. It says it right here. I'm glad that worked out for you. I think uh, more people who were pretty serious about uh, really, really being, you know, confident in their numbers, especially if they're doing, you know, kind of the time series experiments like you are, um, would benefit from from spending a little bit of money on on that kind of equipment. Um, in the grand in the grand scheme of things, and how much money we actually lay down in the hobby, it's not it's not that big a deal. But it's not, you know, it's not pretty like a peppermint angel or anything like that. how much so. did you how much did you get that for it was like 500 bucks about 500 bucks got it used on ebay i mean that's not terrible no it's not terrible but, accurate you know and, and that's why i use the misco um instead of you know any of the other salinity i testers. use it too yeah it's, you got that one for me i see yeah. i use it daily multiple times a day yeah i just get sick of i sick of testing and hoping that it's somewhere in the realm of what it actually is. And yeah. uh, for a little bit of extra money, I feel like I can take a chunk of that anxiety away. You know, the, the, just how the DR does it and how it, it times everything and you know you're doing it the same way every time and, and it's pretty great. So I, I, I recommend it. And it does more tests than I use it for. I mean, it does everything, I think. I just use it for phosphate and nitrate. Um, I don't know if we ever have, but maybe we put a link for, for what that piece of equipment is down there, too, in the right. show. Instead of the, uh, for alkalinity, I use the API test kit because one drop is one DKH, and that's all the resolution I care about. I know, I know, I know. Craig, oh. good, yeah. Um, what was the, what was the, um, what was the scale you wanted us to use? What was the unit you wanted us to use for alkalinity? Um, it, Bingerman's? Some, some mole-based units. So um, milli equivalents per liter or per kilogram or something like that. I can change everything to milliquint per liter next time I talk to you. So just to awesome. give beefers just an for idea. For alkalinity at least. About I mean, then at least then I would know what you were saying as opposed to like the 2.8. Yeah, you know, like that's right. That. It just, well, it, it, it turns it out crazy. that it's one drop per DKH. It yeah. just makes it so easy. And everything else in the hobby is DKH. But next time I talk to you, I'll make sure I have it converted. And Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just saying so beefers know what we're talking about. With this one time, I was talking to Craig about alkalinity, and I used DKH, and he was telling me how it was silly to just use mill equivalents because it was just I and I never looked at it that way because I'm not smart like Craig is, but it was just doing some unnecessary math for no reason. So for most people, it's 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 arbitrary anyway, right? So yes, it doesn't really matter. Um, but if you if you do actually care to understand what's going on. And you're like, want to actually observe the fact that calcium and alkalinity change in a concerted way when you have calcifying organisms in the tank. And that you can predict what happened to the other one by measuring one of them, right? Um, then it, it kind of does, it's more convenient to use uh, one of these concentration units that 
uh, is it basically a counting unit? It, it, for me, it does make a big difference which unit I use because I want to understand quantitative relationships in the in the aquarium. Um, and if you're like designing products or things like that, then it's like really important to actually understand what's happening, right? And not just yeah. So I mean, all you're getting DKH, you're just getting mill equivalents, and then you're multiplying it by blah 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 and getting a number. And then I I never stop to think like there's no freaking reason to do that multiplication to give you a different number. So it it does. Uh, it is convenient when everyone is using the same set of units. And it's just unfortunate that everyone converts to DKH because I, there's, there's no, there's nothing good about it, right? I mean, I, I can't think of a single uh, re reason to recommend DKH over mill equivalents per liter. Yeah, go ahead. I can, but only okay. with the, only with the one titrate, only with the API, API titration test kit. Sure, but but whoever That's set it. up the test kit could have as easily set it up so it was a uh, half a mill equivalent per liter per drop, and then you'd yeah. be just as happy. Yeah, it's about three mill equivalents per liter is where my alkalinity is. Yeah, that's a seawater is like two point two, two point four, or something yeah. like that. So I do a little bit higher. Yeah, it would be nice if we could, I mean, even with the with the nitrate, you know, I'm still never sure what people are reporting their numbers in. You know, is it NO3 right. or right. NO3 minus? Because there's a big difference. Um, right. And most- And that's, so that's, that, that's a funny story. So oh. I was, I had a conversation with Greg Scheimer and I don't know, if, do, do you know who he was? I do. Uh, I recall yeah. the name. So he was, probably one of the best animal husbandry people that I've ever met. I mean, this guy was just amazing. And he was in the New York area when I was starting out. And it was a, really a great benefit to me to have contact with him just to, to learn more about the, you know, the ins and outs of, of animal husbandry. And, you know, they kept me around as kind of the pet chemist who had a little bit of domain knowledge. So that's why I get to tag along with them. Um, but he was he was asking me if he, sh he had a test kit that measured in uh, ammonia nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen or something like that. It is ammonia. And uh, he said, now ammonia gets protonated. And so should I adjust that concentration number based on the pH? And, and I, I knew a couple things. One, Greg's a really was a really smart guy, right? So he was like really thinking about this super hard, and he realized that 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 was the case. But any concentration scale that changes the concentration of something like ammonia based on pH is a concentration scale that really sucks, right? Um, you care about the nitrogen, and and that's that's what you want to hang on to. And so the the nitrate the the NO3 in and uh, ammonia in and stuff like that have a lot of the same properties as the molar concentration scale because interconversion between different oxidation states of nitrogen, so going from ammonia to nitrite to nitrate, doesn't change the nitrogen concentration. So you can follow that stuff through easily, right? It's just a one-to-one -one you know, concentration between the two of them or the three of them. Whereas if you were in like uh, NH, NH3, you know, ammonia and, uh, you know, nitrate is NO3, then you do all these like weird multiplications and, and just confuse yourself basically. So that's the, that's what I don't like about some concentration units is that they seem to just be uh, designed to confuse people. And I don't want people to be confused. I want them to be confident and understand what's happening. Yeah, and, and most people, let's face it, don't care. They just want to be able to have a scale that they understand deviations from and to compare to other systems. That's right. They want to, they want to be able to, they want to, they, they want to be able to have their, their, 
stick size contest with other people on a common scale. And that's, that's right. That's right. Thank you for giving in to the beef. Yeah. Craig said dick. <laughs> it's, it's, I think our, our hobby is small enough that it, it's kind of unbelievable to me that we don't use common scales. You know, we don't have common units. Um, and uh, it, it makes me really grumpy. And, and I, I almost don't care which units we used as long as we used the same freaking units for each thing. That's why on some level, I've sort of like, you know, I, I put up my token, uh, uh, you know, resistance to this, but that, that battle I think was, was lost uh, probably even before I got involved in the hobby. I think it probably could... when, when Albert Thiel or whoever wrote, you know, DKH in the, in the English language, uh, you know, the first books about keeping reefs that, that most people saw, um, it was over with at that point. So, yeah, it's kind of like it gets... whatever foot you put down first and then it's too late yeah. to change it. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. But, you know, if Finland can change from driving on the left to driving on the right mm -hmm. overnight, I think we could change which freaking scales we use in our in our in our hobby. That kind of makes me think all you know for man for the first decade or more I always used specific gravity. But right. For whatever reason I don't remember why but now it's been another decade and more that I've been using salinity now. And I I know I started off doing that because you know back in the day was the horrible swing arm specific right. gravity. Right. Test. Right. Well, I mean, with that, basically, you care about how much salt is dissolved in the water, right? Yeah. And you don't directly care how dense it is unless you're trying to float or you're a dolphin or a fish trying to maintain neutral buoyancy, right? I mean, there, there's like density is, is important there, relative densities. But what we want to know is how much salt's in the water? Is there too much or not enough or just the right amount of salt? And that's what salinity tells you. Well, and the, the silly thing is, to be honest with you, once I finally latched onto salinity, it's just I was tired of saying 1.0, point, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was like, let me just say a two digit number. So the, the, the really bad thing is that people will start um, abbreviating the specific gravity values like 1.025 and they'll say it's oh. 25. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And then that's, that's bad because it's, it's in the same range of values. So people will keep aquariums hypo saline, you know, for various reasons if they're raising fish or something like that. So there will, you, you will find marine organisms living in aquariums at salinity 25. Um, and it's just close enough to be really confusing to people and probably dangerously confusing. Absolutely. And now PSU, right? <laughs> Yeah, but, but practical salinity units. Yeah. I mean, there's there's uh the salinity and PSU are all. I mean, Boomer will probably be upset with me for saying this, but they're all like, um, within hobby precision, identical to each other. Yeah, I've I've had this conversation with Boomer, and he and he says it's the same. It doesn't matter, um, which is right. But I, but so we're changing to PSU now from salinity just because. Things are, mar are are, it's just happening. I, I think maybe, maybe Mazna. I mean, if we had a governing body that that had policy statements and position statements and best practices, or you know, certified hobbyists or importers or stores, we could flow these things out much more efficiently. Well, we could we could pretend like it might work better than than us talking about it here um, yeah but you you also can't pretend that you know like it or not a lot of terminology gets drafted too by the marketing of companies that yeah, make but, things. but we could but but they could be i think they could easily be convinced to get on board i th i think but i'm naive i think maybe um all the people who have won masna awards could <laughs> band together to make things happen yeah, can you we two have... show your glass fish so you can make me feel like the odd man out? 
You don't you don't have one of these, Ben? No, but I got a damn tattoo. <laughs> I, I think, uh, of course, that group is also herding cats as well. That's not a, a homogenous group of people. Not at all, no. But I think they're, you know, I think that's a, that's a group that hasn't been harnessed uh, to, to marshal the forces of goodness. Um, and I think mostly it's because uh, everyone's tired. I think, I think once you get one of those awards, you, you just get it because you're tired. And... Uh, <laughs> The idea. Well, I don't know. I, I think that if we were going to marshal the forces of, of goodness from the uh, Masna Award winners in the course of the year, it might be a statement on uh, inclusivity in the hobby. Would be something that I would be certainly very interested in signing off on as a group. Cool. Now, well, uh, I think you and I should talk about this uh, offline, yeah. and uh, that's probably just as simple as you and I and whoever else we know has already signed it saying, Hey, let's, let's actually do this. So yeah. let's, let's see, let's talk about that and see if we can make that go. Yeah. I want to do something more, more public and, and obvious besides just signing the petition that, that didn't seem like enough to me. So. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. We'll do that. You have more beef with us. You want to beef? Go. All over I do. Us? I've got, I've got, I've got like a lot of beef. I'm not sure exactly where we are in the arc of the episode of the of the episode and how much time we've got but um, you have about 15 minutes left yeah so i, I <laughs> um when you were talking with felicia i really i enjoyed that episode quite a bit and uh what was the magic number is it 68 or 60 it's magic number some, some temperature right that, oh that 74 horses 74. 74 okay see i would have over refrigerated my seahorse um yes ben oh no i was just saying I, oh okay that's the number i came i came in um, in the clinch. so you were i think there was a discussion about how you know the difficulty that that women face in becoming authors and, and stuff like that and and rich made the point which is like really i think valid um that it's it's pretty hard to actually if you're a guy right and and that's that's true. I don't actually know how hard it was for me. It was just more like a weird compulsion or something like that, right? It was like I something that I I had to do there for a while. But um, and I, I do know that I spent a lot of effort on it. But I I also thought it was like incredibly rewarding as well. So I don't know exactly how to characterize it. But to the extent that it was difficult, um, it was a lot less difficult for me to, to break into that world, I think, than it, w it would have been for a woman. And, and they just have, the barriers are, are just, just higher there and in so many different ways. So that was a, that was like the one, I was like, I wish I could like jump in and say, yeah, and it's really harder for, for women too. Um, you mean uh, as in I, respects to like saying being in a store or being somewhere on a forum or wherever? I think, I think the, uh, I think the the context was more in terms of uh, being recognized in the hobby, writing articles and getting invited to be a speaker and, and that kind of stuff. And, I mean, I uh, get it. That's, that's, that isn't and shouldn't be easy for anybody of any gender, but I can totally get how that could be, that that is, can be even more so difficult for a woman because it's just- there's, there's, there's no doubt that it is, right? Yeah. I mean- there's a plethora of reasons why it's easier for men coming yeah. from just this, this simple, the simplest one, which is um, in society or in our society, men are more easily taken as authority than women are. So just from that tiny bit of privilege that people are used to listening to men more on, right. on in science or in any kind of authority than they are for women, it that just makes it easier. Now, and I think the only point I was making is that it's it's not necessarily easy for men either, but it's right. definitely harder for women. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, man, and I'm not pandering by saying this. I'm just glad I don't see it that way because the, the, I just don't. I just hear someone start talking, and I can just decide within a couple minutes. Damn, this person's smart. 
I'll just shut the fuck up and listen. And that happens with a lot of people with me. <laughs> sure. And, and that's the way that it, it should be. But that, that's not the way that it is in, in the round. And I think Felicia had a great story about how someone just wouldn't, wouldn't talk to her because she was a woman on some tech support role. Yeah. And she was the one who was coming up with all the answers. But they, the words had to be spoken by a, a male to be taken seriously. And that's, that's fucking ridiculous. Pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that Hunter was a was a mechanical engineer and he worked on jet turbines. So that was a that was yeah, like a cool. little I, I was introduced to him by Michelle and uh I think they're both they're both super into rasses and you know the RAS people are you know that's that's a real yeah that's, that's a click there and you know <laughs> don't don't go dissing the rasses because they're gonna <laughs> be in a lot of trouble. Um uh Matt Wandell I enjoyed a lot of stuff that you guys were talking about and the, the turnover calculations and flow and stuff like that. And I was like, had this thought when, when he was on, it's like, you're talking about putting, you know, injecting chemicals into the sump, right. And, uh, and where you would put them and, and, and that kind of stuff. That's always a tricky thing when it comes to calcium and alkalinity, you ideally you would have like a, a pressure pump. that would like shoot the stuff into the pipe after it had gone through the pump, you know, and then it go directly into the tank because, you know, your chemical supplements are not in general doing you a lot of good hanging out in your sump. <laughs> you want them up where the organisms are so that they can do what they're supposed to be doing. Um, uh, but, but putting it in a, in a small, well-mixed container slowly, um, kind of upstream of a pump is as close as we can do that with a, without obviously pressure feeding additives, you know, on the, on the pressure side of a pump is, is fraught with difficulties, especially if something goes wrong and then you start squirting, you know, water out of this new hole that you didn't anticipate in your system. You can do some very interesting things with, with big water volume. Um, big sumps are nice. You talked about trash cans, I remember in a, <laughs> oh that that was a beef yes yeah you completely screwed that up so it was like this massive confusion <laughs> massive confusion about what is a trash what's a trash can and what's like a stock tank okay so the stock tanks are the ones that are made out of structural foam you know that thick kind of foam and the uh, trash cans are just like thin uh plastic the stock tanks are the ones that people will often use for, for sumps and they're, yeah. they're rich, right? So you yeah. can often get away with, with drilling bulkheads in them. Um, I did have one surprise with, with one of them that I picked up here locally. Um, and I was going to do, I was actually going to like, yeah, I was going to use it for a uh, marine aquarium purpose. And I got it home and I like started, I, I undid the, the bulkhead. And I realized that they put a metal insert in there to strengthen the threads, right? And I was like, well, I won't be using that. What, what the hell can I do, you know, with, with this now? Because it's completely inappropriate for, for marine use. Um, but yeah, trash cans versus stock tanks. And, and then you were, you were saying it was like you had the cows eating out of the water tanks. And I grew up on a farm and that was just like, I don't know what to do with you guys multi-purpose rubbermaid tank yeah that was uh, um the, the stuff that you feed the cows rooks. out of is very shallow so that they can get into it right whereas the water water tanks tend to be quite a bit deeper that was brooks foresight so what would you so it's a stock tank and it, it, that's for water yeah that, yeah okay well, he's just talking about those those Rubbermaid. Like, I have one in my garage and one outside. The one in the garage that holds the um, my dry live rock. It's just that Rubbermaid kind of stock tank. You can get them from, like, Tractor Supply Company or places like that. Are they yeah. Rubbermaid? Rubber, ru Rubbermaid yeah, rubber sells them, and there's other – they used to. I don't know that they make them anymore. There's other brands that have kind of taken over that space. Yeah. Um, you can get Brute trash cans. Yeah, and some of them were made out of FDA resins, and I've used those for mixing salt water in, in the past. Yeah, 
A, um, a lot of people seem to have very good luck um, putting bulkheads on those trash cans, even though they're curved. The curve ones? Yeah. 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 You just tighten the crap out of it. I guess. Yeah. You can, it out. you can also use, uh, what's that style of bulkhead that's just that rubber grommet? Uniseal. Uh, yeah, Uniseal. That's right. Yeah, you can use those. Those work well for curve. It's just, yeah. I, don't, I know you. I know that those are pretty trustworthy. It's just I don't trust them like regular. Yeah, man. I mean, you're, you're talking, you're talking my range here. I mean, this is total aquarium maintenance guy stuff. You can totally put a bulkhead on there. Just crank the shit out of it. It's funny. It's, it's some of the stuff that, that we used to think was a crazy idea to do as the hobby gets bigger, people just do it out of expediency and it turns out to work just fine. You know, we used to think a whole lot in, in the eighties about how, what you were drilling a hole in and what its shape was and how you were going to put a bulkhead through it. And the wisdom was do not put it in any, anything that's curved. You're asking for problems. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember like in a curved surface, you know, uh, sandwiching with bolts, you know, sandwiching acrylic on two sides of it to make a flat surface for a bulkhead. I mean, we used to do all that kind of stuff. As it turns out, you know, some a bulkhead in a trash can kind of works too. I mean, how did that ever get around? Did someone like it was that where I mean, I for as long as I've known the regular duty hobby bulkheads are, I believe they're made out of polystyrene sometimes. It, did someone have a shitty bulkhead and it popped off or something? Because, man, I've been doing that since the mid-90s. It's always worked for me. Couldn't tell you. The well, difference between the 80s and the 90s in reef keeping is a huge step change. <laughs> yeah, it was. What? 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 Huh? Huh? Hey, Richard, you know how, if you like the show, how you can help us and shit? How can I help us and shit, Ben? <laughs> you can, uh, you can, uh, you know, go on the YouTubes and hit the bell, the subscribe bell, and obviously share it in Facebook groups, forum groups, uh, share it with your relatives and your enemies alike. And uh, also putting comments on YouTube. We always like that. I used to say in the beginning that I was never going to look at them, but I go and I, I'll make comments. Hell, you even ask a question on there. I might answer it. Um, also, too, there's the um, the membership on our website on the reefbeefpodcast.com slash memberships. And don't forget to hit the notification. It'll notify you when a new show comes out. Um, obviously, we're on all the platforms on all the podcast platforms. So, you know, notify yourself on there when we get new stuff coming out. Um, we have memberships, too, where you can join different levels of memberships and some of those you know, you can ask questions that we will then answer on on the show. That's always direct, a fun thing to do. Direct access to the beef. Direct, direct beefal access. So gently stroke the like and <laughs> subscribe <laughs> and help us keep this show going. We really appreciate your support. You buy us a beer, get a membership or any of the stuff Ben said. Thank you so much, beefers. Thank you, beefers. What? 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 Huh? Huh? Um, another thing that you guys talked about was was citric acid and mm. oh yeah, yeah. acetic acid and stuff like that. So Rich, you made a comment along those lines that that you thought that one of your systems was doing poorly uh, because you were dosing too much vinegar. Yeah. Yeah. And offline, I'd like to know kind of like if if you have like notes about how much you were adding. Because I'm really curious about what, what that threshold might have been that your system I, started having problems. I do. I can tell you right now what I was doing. I was doing about 70 milliliters a day of and vinegar. And how big of a... Was that in your... In the 400-gallon system. Okay. That's, that's where it was and things were okay. And then I got it in my head that I should do more. Um... And I upped it to a hundred. Okay. Uh, and I dosed the vinegar directly into the display. Oh, 
Okay. When I dosed it, 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 but but that gets dosed over the course of the day, you know, with a peristaltic sure, pump. Sure, right. Which is what you were saying before about chemicals. Peristaltic pumps now are inexpensive, um, and if you can spread it out and it's diluted, they well, are. Yeah. It's a great way to put the stuff where you want it. Mm-hmm. When I was doing the vinegar into the sump, I would get this those bacterial mats mm-hmm. that would clog up my pumps, and then right. I went why am I dosing vinegar into the sump? That's not where I want anything to grow. That was my brain, my brain, my brain. Yeah. Child of that. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting. So the whole organic carbon subject is, is interesting because uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I proposed using uh, acetic acid or vinegar to kind of like boost the concentration of calcium hydroxide was that I knew that it was uh, um, it was used by corals. So mm-hmm. there's in really old scientific literature. One, you know, as soon as they figured out how to make radioisotopes, they're like feeding it to everything and figuring out what they would take up. And corals take up acetate pretty avidly. So it's it's direct coral food. You know, energy equivalents going into your corals. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the, the formate based stuff um, is not. And it's really hard for complex organisms to get any energy at all out of one carbon substrates. Um, yeah. that, that seems to be going mainly into archaea, which is interesting. And I'd like to, I'd like to understand a little bit more some, someday, you know, when I have some time to actually do some aquarium experiments about what's, what's going on, what's going on there and what the, what the kinetics are of of that stuff yeah. changing in the in the system because i don't think people really quite know how long that persists and how long it takes to get converted into uh bicarbonate which is ultimately what what they're putting it in for so um, I've, I've usually thought of vinegar as like a bacteria food no and, and but you're saying it's more like direct coral food energy it's it's an everything food so just about every form of life can take up acetate and convert it into energy. It sits at a very privileged position in metabolism, kind of at the head of the TCA cycle, which is the main energy generating loop in, in complicated organisms and bacteria. So yeah, so I'm thinking it's of very, it's very easy to get it in. It's, it's almost as easy as glucose, right? So almost everything will, will take up glucose. I will probably start adding it again with the idea that it is a food and a bacterial food, not a filtration method. Um, and, and, and hopefully, and put a big note uh, on the peristaltic pump that says, this is food not for nutrient control. So I don't get a stillborn brainchild again and fuck everything up by going, just turn it up. Oh yeah, do oh. that stuff. Tell us everything. So this is funny. Um, Citric acid. I started writing on the internet about a chemistry, you know, the chemistry aquarium nexus um, in, in the early 90s. And at one point I was like referred to as the guy who, the citric acid guy who said you ought to use it to clean your aquariums. So it's, it's a really effective cleaning agent that's, uh, strong and yet you know not quite as as full contact as as hydrochloric acid is um it has the interesting property that it will actually chelate calcium and magnesium that it dissolves and kind of like get it out of uh kind of a little bit out of solution that way and allow more stuff to dissolve uh um it, and it, it's also can, if you're cleaning glass or something like that, it's a little bit of a mild abrasive as well. So if you've got a, if you've got glass that has fine haze on it, you can get a microfiber cloth and, and take, take, uh, you know, any deposits off of it really fast with, with citric acid, citric acid and a little bit of water. Much uh, better than vinegar. Vinegar was always a kind of a standby. You got a whole stain tank and a razor blade and vinegar. Way, way better than vinegar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and and I think that you guys were talking about it in terms of you know uh, acetic acid 
combining with certain plastics and, and going dissolving into them. And that that absolutely does. That's true. There are some materials that are just really super susceptible to uh, acetic acid. And if your pump is made out of one of those materials, it could negatively affect it pretty quickly. So yeah, that's what that was. Someone was saying it was like breaching through the plastic and messing up the magnets. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a acetic acid. You know, you can buy it uh, glacial, and it's they call it glacial because it it will freeze it just below room temperature. But it's a liquid. It's like any other organic solvent, and it will dissolve things just like any other organic solvent. And some of those things that it will dissolve are are certain plastics. Yeah. So there's there's actually a coal. I'll send you guys the link for this. Uh, Cole Palmer has a really uh, excellent chemical compatibility chart that they put up for free. And if anyone has any questions along those lines about materials, it's a really great place to, to look. So, so the question people have is, not for cleaning the glass, for cleaning pumps. Yeah. Vinegar, citric acid, or 10%. And uh, right. can you can can you chime in on each of those? I mean, you know, we always say ten percent. You have to know what you're doing because it's a real acid, and bad things can happen. So we don't recommend it, but we do talk yeah. about it. Right. So I think the issue with ten percent is not so much the ten percent; it's getting it to ten percent. So people usually buy thirty. You know, and when you're talking ten percent, you're talking about a. a one tenth dilution of muriatic acid, which is about actually 37% hydrogen chloride by, by weight. Um, that stuff is nasty. Um, you don't want to have it in your basement. You don't want to have it in your garage. It will just rust everything. Um, uh -oh, I know I people have it in who have. My truck. I use it daily. The 37%. Yeah, in a bottle. In the, in the, That's in the, it, not inside my truck, but in the bed of my it's truck. Out, it's, it's, it's outside, right? So it's, yeah. in the, it's in the air. But if you get that stuff in a combined space, the, the hydrogen chloride will build up. And actually, it's very, you know, HCl is super corrosive. So you'll, your, your metal stuff will not like you very much. And if you have, like, expensive woodworking tools or something like that, you're going to be sad really fast if you keep muriatic acid around. So and years ago when I first system. used it, I cleaned, up a, I cleaned up a vat in a garage and the next day everything was rusted everywhere. And I was like, what the hell just happened? That's, that's right. That's right. So if you want to keep it around, dilute it, then there's way less of an issue? Or there's or still... Just, an once issue. It's, once it's, so once it's diluted to one, one part, you know, one tenth, the regular concentration, uh, the vapor pressure of HCl goes way down and it's more completely ionized. The problem with the concentrated stuff is that it's not H plus and Cl, not all of it's dissociated. There's a, a fair amount of HCl molecule there that can just go right back into the vapor phase. Okay. Um, and at higher dilution, it dissociates in the, into ions and they're not volatile anymore. So they're charged, the charged things just don't go flying off into the air. It's usually neutral things that, okay. that, that go into the vapor phase. And just a practical question, because somebody asked me, would you uh, dilute it with uh, distilled or DI water or just straight tap water? Do you see a difference? No, I, um, if, if you've got like exceptionally hard alkaline water you might see a little fizz <laughs> you put hcl in it but it's such a strong acid that it's just going to completely overwhelm you know any buffering capacity in the water perfect for the record i use rodi water that i have on my truck already and i, I just think there's no there's no reason not not to use rodi but if you needed to dilute some out and you weren't using it for if you're just using it for cleaning purposes um like aquarium cleaning purposes and you yeah. weren't doing chemistry with it right right um it doesn't really matter what what else is there because as soon as you put it on your whatever it is that you're going to be cleaning and a little bit of that dissolves 
you'll have as much calcium in the water as you had in your tap water, right? So it's right. just like. Okay, great. So we've got 10% and then we got citric and then we got vinegar. So you would say you would be in the camp of let's just use the citric for cleaning because it's, um, it's not going to get into plastics in the same way and it's pretty buff. It, it's, it's relatively strong and uh, it's a, it's a good deal safer than, than concentrated HCL. So um, I've got a bag of this stuff in the house, right? And I've got a four year old and I'm okay with that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have any hydrochloric acid in the house with, with Kai around, right? So it's just like the household safety kind of stuff is, there's nothing wrong with using HCL if, you, if you're set up to handle it safely. Um, it works very effectively. I've used it, you know, it's like, I mean, it's, it's they're, they're roughly equivalent uh, in cleaning power. And uh, there's a little, there's, there's a difference in safety, which may or may not be significant depending on other, other things in your life, really. So uh, what about this? Um, I use 10% to kill Mahano anemones and pests. Uh, I do too. Zoanthids. Um, would citric acid do the same or not? I don't know, but it'd be fun to try find out, wouldn't it? All right. What, uh, uh, what concentrate, uh, how much, do, how much citric Sat acid? Saturated. Make it as strong as you can make it. Just put make it, a just saturated keep, solution. Just keep dissolving into it until you can't. Until no more will dissolve, yeah. Okay, I'll, tr I'll Great, try. I'll try. We'll try. And so then maybe, then maybe after you you pour off the saturated solution, put in just a little bit more water to keep it from uh, precipitating out in your uh, syringe needle or something like that. Okay, I'll give it a Would try. Would you say say you have a reservoir of fresh water and then you use a, a you know a, a top off in a peristaltic pump to drive that water through like a caulkwas or stir? Would, would it ever be a thing to spike or dope that fresh water with citric acid? Would that do? I do that occasionally with vinegar, except for it makes the vat, just like Richard was saying. I've done it. I've just poured vinegar into a freshwater reservoir, but it starts making bacterial mats in there. Right. So if you, if you have a problem with bacterial mats with acetate, it's going to be even worse with citrate because it's an e even kind of a, better, more preferred carbon source for a lot of, uh, you know, I told you about acetate going into the TCA cycle, which is this energy generating loop. The C in there is, you know, it's tricarboxylic acid and citrate is one of the, one of the particip participants in that. So it spins into energy generation and you can back it out to glucose a lot more easily. So it's, it's an even better uh, thing for growing bacteria than uh, okay and and the, the other thing about citric acid in lime water is that calcium citrate is not freely soluble it's it's slightly it's only slightly soluble so you're okay. not going to really increase the concentration of the lime water by putting citric acid into it because you'll make calcium citrate and that's okay. insoluble okay <laughs> okay <laughs> what about doping that water with vinegar? Does that do anything? The water into a lime lime water reactor? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it will it will dissolve a little bit more uh, calcium hydroxide. Okay. And when I was trying to figure out, you know, how to give lime water a little extra oomph, um, I suggested that people could do that, and there was a recipe for that as well. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to triangulate with, with Rich's story was whether or not, you know, the suggestion that I, that I had, which I thought was safe at the time, um, and I had used in my system for, for quite a while before I wrote it up, um, whether or not I was in, into a potentially problematic range or not with that recommendation. So I'm happy to get actual data back from people who've, who've use stuff like that cool you got another short one where where i want to be respectful of your yeah, borax. i i do i do my friend borax 20 meal team borax 
what um, and these... this is this is a beef you guys were like talking about ph electrodes and i was like i don't know what we're talking about right so um uh there's a there's a really uh, uh cool uh ph standards that you can make if you don't have any you're concerned that your sachets have got your bottles too old or whatever you don't have anything else um, you can take a half level teaspoon of borax in a pint of water makes a so the thing about that's interesting about borax is in the in the crystal there's an equal amount of acid and base forms so it's a natural buffer right and so if you got pure borax, you put it in a solution and it dissolves to give you one, you know, a very, very stable, well-controlled pH value. And at room temperature, that pH value for that solution, half a, half a teaspoon in a pint of pint water, of water uh, gives you a pH value of 9.23. Hmm. And, you know, um, there's a lot of half teaspoons in one of these things. So you can, uh, you can check a lot of pH electrodes that way. Uh, the commercial borax stuff is, is just about as good as the pure you know, reagent uh, okay. borax is. It gives a good, good pH value. Um, but you know, when people talk about starting to like, oh, well, maybe your pH electrode needs to be calibrated. Um, in my experience, the calibration of pH electrodes and pH measuring electronics is, is usually so the, it's the electronics really that you're you're calibrating right yeah. so the pH electrode is doing whatever it's doing it's like a electrochemical standard system um, the one thing that does happen to pH electrodes over time when they're used is that the internal electrolyte will start to get dilute and so they start out internally at like four molar potassium chloride. And there's this little fret, right? And that high salt will, will gradually just sort of like fizzle out into your, into your aquarium. And then you won't, have a, you, know, you won't have the same junction potential as you had when your electrode was new. And things will start to drift and they'll start, your P, measured pH values will, 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 you'll start to chase your calibration. And what that means is not that you need to calibrate your pH electrode more often. You need to either, one, if it's refillable, replace that internal solution. But most of the pH electrodes in the hobby are like a gel-filled sort of non-refillable electrodes. And that's just fine. Um, it means that you just need to throw your fucking pH electrode away and get another one. They're not that expensive. So is there a good happy average when you say to do that or could it be all across the board? I think it probably does depend a little bit on exactly what electrode you've got because this is like how fast does the electrolyte drizzle out into the water, you know, as a function of time. It depends on how the, the body is manufactured a little bit and how much elect electrolyte there is to drizzle out, right? How beefy, beefy. Beefy the electrode is yes. Um, uh, it, I, I would just say is if, if you if you've got a pH electrode and it's been in a system more than six months and you calibrate it and it looks like the calibration has changed, um, you can you can try that once and then if it changes again the second time, just get rid of the damn thing. No good. So, yeah. uh, Interesting. Because I find that my pH electrodes don't seem to drift at all. They seem to give me consistent readings over long periods of time. So a as you were talking, I was they, like, they should. like over years, you know, like. Yeah, well, they can. It depends on the, it depends on the electrode, right? So yeah. um, if, it, if it is manufactured in a way that it, it loses that internal electrolyte strength very slowly and uh, it, there just needs to be, you know, a few ions going across the junction for it to fulfill its purpose. Um, they can last for a very long period of time. And salt water is a much more friendly matrix to pH electrodes than freshwater aquariums yeah. are. Now those guys go through pH electrodes like crazy because uh, the, the 
salt concentration in fresh water is like ne negligible. So the ions are just like pouring out of the junction yeah. and they don't last more than a few months in a fresh water system. Yeah. So I was I mean, thinking uh, instead of instead of getting, you know, the uh, you know, the sachets with the seven and the ten, instead just mixing up the borax, dropping the electrode in and seeing is it close to nine point two three um a, a, as a way to kind of test rather than to recalibrate the electronics, given that yeah, it's a yeah, it's a valid it's a validation. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. depending on your depending on your uh your pH electrode you know your ph measuring rig um there's a good reason for using a ph7 solution because that's zero millivolts right and and so that lets you set the zero of the system pretty effectively and then you usually set the slope of the electronics with either the four or the the ten yeah i'm um, just talking so about validation yeah, validation. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. and there actually are, like, if you if you have like a high end lab uh, pH system, they will let you use borax as a calibration standard because it is a primary standard. Great. Yeah. Great. So I mean, that's what you're saying is you could do the the half of a level teaspoon of borax in one pint of RODI water. And you could throw it in, and if it's not reading 9.23, 9.26, uh, I think I said it's 9.23. So you could just kind of use it as a standard. You throw your probe in there, and, and you're like, wait a minute, something's off. And, it, and so that'd be like a quick way to be able to tell if you need to take further action to either right. calibrate right. it or chunk it or whatever. So the, the there is a little bit of, of uh, temperature dependence in those numbers. So if you're at 25 C or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, it's 9.18. Um, uh, 20 is uh, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's yeah. the one that was 9.23. And for us- Is there somewhere online that has that scale, that graph? of temperature versus this probably I, there there are, there are I should probably just make a PDF of this damn article and put it up somewhere because probably well, should. so, it, so it we was, could link to it here. But I do want to yeah. point out the idea that you know that's also a bunch of number chasing because <laughs> most people don't have a thermometer that's calibrated. So you're guessing um to know that you know is it the right and and did you mix it up the right way so i yeah. i would say as long as it's close to 9.23 close in your mind your system's already you just want you're just validating that the probe isn't going nuts so right if it, everything's the same you you've already set your calcium reactor to be working the way it's working you've already set your ph of your tank you know how that is you just want to check to make sure the probe isn't insane. So I right. would say don't take action unless it's way off from the borax. Right. So I think the, the, the reason that I mentioned those numbers, and it, it is a bunch of numbers, the real point is that this, this particular buffer system has a pretty flat uh, uh, pH as a function of temperature. So that means it's pretty forgiving. Yeah. It also has a very flat, uh, concentration dependence. So if you're a little bit off in the measurement, right? I mean, I'm not telling people to use an analytical balance. To make, make, it's like a level, you know, a half level teaspoon is not exactly the most precise thing in the world, but it doesn't really matter because as I recall, the, um, uh, the dilution, okay, it's in, it's in the article too. I did a fairly, fairly thorough job in my youth. Um, that uh, changing the concentration of the, the borate by a factor of two uh, changes the pH. Diluting it by a factor of two increases the pH by 0 0.01 pH units. So it's very forgiving as far as the concentration is concerned. Great. Okay. Great. Any uh, last words of wisdom, Craig? And then we're going to kick you out. And then, uh, but, but if you'll come back to, to, take us to task with more rotten beef we would love oh man it. we would be, that'd yeah. be rad if, if craig beeferman was our our like official reef beef like science 
double checker, fact checker. That's probably asking too much of him. So I um, enjoy doing shows like this. You know, I was on Reef Threads a bunch of different times and they stopped doing that. And uh, I think that this is like a really, um, it's very accessible for people. Um, and it's a chance for me to do a little bit of, of uh, like outreach and education. And so I'm, I'm really happy to, to be on here whenever, you know, you guys want me to be on. And also right. like when we get to 500 subscribers, Richard's going to do a show under his house. And when we, when we get to 2000, I'm going to wear spandex. I, so I maybe at 2000, yeah, but... you can come back on and you can wear spandex with me. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but I, I would definitely come on and, and watch you wear spandex. <laughs> <laughs> that would be notable that'll be a big episode uh, you know whenever you guys want me to, to come back on just let me, give me give me a little bit of heads time, up and i'll next I'll time you on. gotta get a tattoo i'm gonna get a tat three tat three <laughs> tat three tat four craig thank you very much this is exactly what by the way if you're watching this if you go to a MACNOR or a conference where me and Ben and Craig are, this is what's happening in a hotel room somewhere. It, this yeah, conversation. It yeah. um, it's great. It's great. I already have like a list of questions for Craig for next time of things that we, we didn't get to. So I'm excited. So thanks for listening. And Craig, thank you so much uh, yeah, for thanks. coming on. Yeah, and ben, thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Ben, any last words? Thank you, Craig. What are you, are you drinking? Protein drink. Oh, wait, I shouldn't show the... It looks like vegetable stock. <laughs> it's like, I'm it drinking does. Ensure. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you a regular? <laughs> I'm quite regular, partner. Hey, one more thing. I want Snowman to put this in there later, but it, he, could, he could splice it in somewhere. But I'm wearing the shirt of my homeboy Shane, 24-7 Aquariums in Florida, and I just want to give a shout-out to Shane. Shout-out, Shane. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to um, the, the green bubble tea that I'm drinking. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and the guy, Larry, that made it for you. Right. Shout out for Larry. Good job, Larry. Larry made my bubble tea. <laughs>